So guns to people that are uh, have, have uh, serious uh, psychological problems. You can't sell guns to minors. Bloomberg was one of several lawmakers backing the terror gap bill, a bill that would give the attorney general the discretion to deny the transfer of a firearm when a background check reveals the purchaser is a known or suspected terrorist and believes the person may use the weapon in connection with terrorism. Oddly, strangely, and well, in this case, though the Department of Justice may be informed that your name is on a, wa a, wa a terrorism watch list, they can't stop you from buying the gun. That's what we're trying to, uh, a, a gap we're trying to fill here with this legislation. It sounds simple, except for one rather major obstacle the constitutional right for American citizens to own guns. And Senator Lindsey Graham also pointed out the problem with the watch lists themselves, so fraught with mistakes, as CNN reported two years ago, even eight-year-old boys can be listed as potential terrorists. Are you a terrorist? I don't know. There's a disconnect here between what we're saying in reality, the watch list, when you look at the numbers, has so many problems with it that I think is not appropriate to go down the road that we're going because a constitutional right is involved. Everyone can agree, I think, that we don't want terrorists to be able to purchase guns. But the real issue is how does one get on the watch list? Because we know now, you know, the government has released several reports that about 35% of people that are on the, the, the watch list are Americans that are placed on there based on, you know, faulty information. Bloomberg and others are trying to use Fazel Shazad's attempted bombing in New York as momentum to push the bill through. The Times Square terror suspect bought a rifle just this March. And he did so legally. Fazel Shazad had no criminal history, and CNN has now confirmed he wasn't on anybody's watch list. But backers of the bill say even if he was on a watch list, the government report shows he would have a 90% chance he'd still be able to buy a gun. Drew Griffin, CNN, Atlanta. Tonight's Big 360 interview, Bill Maher, in a recent Vanity Fair article, when asked to describe his current state of mind, he answered, cautiously pessimistic. Bill Maher joins me now. Uh, Bill, so should people on the terror watch list be able to buy guns? <laughs> Well, you know, this is America, Anderson. Everyone should be able to buy guns, as many as they want, as often as they want, to use wherever they want. That's the American way. You know the most important amendment is the Second Amendment. Everything comes after that. I'm kidding, of course. Uh, no, I'm, I'm for gun control. You know, that would be controlling guns to a degree. It's an interesting question that sort of catches the right wing because, I mean, they're against terrorism, but then again, they're for guns. Well, and it, I mean, it's um, interesting the GAO, but, you know, we said, do live in a, GAO said like 91% of those on the no-fly list, you know, could pass background checks and, and get guns. It's, it, I think it surprises a lot of folks. Right. I also think we should change the no-fly list to the no getting on the damn plane list. I think they need to make that a little more clear <laughs> to more people. Specific. The, uh, the, you know, the initial reaction that the New York's mayor and some other politicians had was that this was a lone wolf, a one-off. Do, do you think they were being too politically correct? I don't think it matters. You know, I think what matters is that there are a lot of um, young Muslim men uh, in this country and overseas um, who are on the edge here. I mean, this guy, like a lot of the terrorists we find out about, wasn't poor. You know, he was living this middle-class life. And then, you know, the backup plan, terrorism. <laughs> His wife left him or the house was underwater or something, and then... You know, I know I'm a broken record about religion, but, you know, when, it, when that stuff is in your head, it just gives you this neurological disorder, and, you know, anything is possible. Uh, I don't think the problem is that guys like this hate America. I think the problem is that they like America, and they feel guilty about it. You know, they come here, and they like eating at Chili's, and they like the water slide, and they like going to the strip club. And then they get on their jihadi websites and they feel terribly guilty about it. And they decide, well, if things go bad, or maybe they don't decide. This guy didn't look like he had much of a plan. Um, but it just hits them, you know. Yes, visiting a painful chastisement on the infidel. Yeah, that's appealing, too. <laughs> or I might go home and watch Nip Tuck. <laughs> it's between those two? Yeah, it seems like that.
Bill Maher is just getting started. More from the interview ahead. Let's continue with more of the Big 360 interview with Bill Maher. Uh, on your show last week, you took on Islamic radicals who made threats against the craters of South Park. I want to show our viewers some of what you said. When South Park got threatened last week by Islamists incensed at their depiction of Muhammad, it served, or should serve, as a reminder to all of us that our culture isn't just different than one that makes death threats to cartoonists. It's better. Because when I make a joke about the Pope, he doesn't send one of the Swiss guards in their striped pantaloons <laughs> to stick a pike in my ass. <laughs> when I make a Jewish joke, rabbis make kvetch about it, but they don't pull out a scimitar and threaten an adult circumcision. <laughs> and when I insult Scientology, the worst that happens is it... <laughs> so... So why, I mean, why is Islam the one religion about which so many in America sense, and the West censor themselves when it comes to talking about or making fun of? Is it just fear? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, because they're violent, because they threaten us, and they are threatening. They bring that desert stuff to our world. I said the same thing Friday night. You know, we don't threaten each other. We sue each other. That's the sign of civilized people, <laughs> and, uh, and they don't. You know, yes, we do have religious nuts in this country. There was a cleric in Iran who recently said that earthquakes were caused by slutty women. Well, Pat Robertson once said that abortions uh, caused hurricanes, I think. But the difference is Pat Robertson doesn't have the power to cut your arms off. You know, I mean, people who, who want to gloss over the difference between Western culture and Islamic culture and forget about the fact that the Islamic culture is 600 years younger and that they are going through the equivalent of what the West went through with our Middle Ages, our Dark Ages, when religion had way too much power um, and we had inquisitions and things like that, uh, do so at their peril. You and, know, and when, when, when they caught this guy... Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, no I, I, when you hear... You know, the, the off refrain from American Muslims and the vast majority of American Muslims, you know, abhor this kind of stuff. You know, they will say, look, Islam is a religion of peace. Do you buy that? Yeah, they blow you up. There's a PC over there. There's a PC over there. There's a PC over there. Uh, is it a religion of peace? You know, I don't know. I, I, I have not read the Koran uh, in its original. When you read the translation, there are many, many, many passages that are not peaceful at all that are about killing the infidel and so forth. There are many passages like that in the Bible too. Not as many. And we don't take it seriously. That's the difference. We blow off our religions. If we took the Bible seriously, we'd look over our fence on Sunday morning, see our neighbor mowing his lawn and think, huh, working on Sunday, I really should kill him. <laughs> but we don't do that. You, but, you know, there are entire schools. You, you know this, Anderson. You're a globetrotter. You've been to madrasas in Pakistan and so forth. Entire schools where the kids read just one book. They're memorizing the Koran. That's all they do. You know, that's not what we do in this country. I, I want to talk a little bit about what's happening on the, on the Gulf Coast, the oil spill. How do you think the response has been? I mean, do you think, do you think BP is going to pay for it? <laughs> well, they'll never, they may pay for the spill itself. They'll never pay for all the ancillary damage. Um, that goes on. Um, so, I, you know, I, I have no idea what the response is so far. It's, it's, it's too early. And, and, I, and to me, that's not even the, the, the bigger question. The bigger question is, you know, why aren't we moving forward to get off the oil? You know, something we should have started doing in the 70s. You know that in <clears throat> 1984, the average fuel economy for a car was 20 miles per gallon. 20 years later, in 2004, and think about all the technological advances that took place between 84 and 2004, CDs and the Internet and, uh, you know, whatever's going on with Bruce Jenner. I mean, there's just been a lot of advances. <laughs> what is going on with Bruce Jenner? This is a question I have been wondering. I don't know. And have That's, not I, I should yet. not have opened. I shouldn't. <laughs> I should not have opened that can of worms. I think everybody but, uh, has that question, but people are afraid to ask. 1984. 
Average car fuel mileage efficiency, 20 miles per gallon. 2004, 20.7. We rocketed up 0.7 in 20 years. This country has not been serious about uh, reducing our dependence on oil. Uh, I got to say, I had Mike, Bra uh, Mike Brown from, uh, you know, Brownie, heck of a job, from FEMA on the program last night. Sure. And he has this theory that right. the, the Obama administration wanted this spill to spread, wanted it to spread up the East Coast, uh, because their secret plot is to halt all offshore drilling, even though the Obama administration has now publicly supported it. And going back to 2008 in the debates, Obama was supporting uh, some forms of off offshore drilling. Yeah, they're so desperate to make this Obama's fault. You know, as soon as it happened, we heard this is his Katrina because, you know, in the minds of those who don't think too far or too deeply, okay, disaster, Louisiana... Okay, that's enough. <laughs> that's enough. I don't have to think any further. Bush had his Katrina. Obama had it. Except that, you know, uh, Katrina was something that he was warned about. It was a natural disaster. And they kept saying, you know, days before, the storm is coming. No one kept saying to Obama, oh, the, the rig is going to blow in three days. <laughs> it's brewing up there in the Gulf. Uh, Bill Maher, always good to have you on. Bill, thanks. Pleasure, Anderson. Uh, next on the program.